Welcome back into our class as we continue to have our discussion about leadership, church leadership, specifically biblical leadership. That's what we have been talking about. And in our last sessions, we were dealing with specifically with the issue of plurality, the plurality of leadership. There is no such thing as one man rule. There is no such thing as one man rule in the church. Although I do realize, of course, that that is common practice in many, many churches where the pastor is the chief, he is the chief operating officer, he's the chief honcho, he's the big cheese, he is the only cheese in the house. I understand that, of course. But if you're ever going to develop leadership and you're ever going to expand the impact that you're going to have in ministry, then you must line up with biblical leadership the way the Bible has designed it to be. There is a difference between church interpretation and biblical interpretation. And by and large, the majority of the churches and pastors live and die by church interpretation rather than by biblical interpretation. So what we've attempted to do here, at least at the level of a Bible college, Bible university, seminary classes, okay, is to focus in on what the Bible and what the scriptures actually says. Now, what your interpretation and what your denomination and what your church says and beliefs is another issue. We're not, here, we're not here to teach you church interpretation. We're not here to teach you denominational interpretation. We're not here to engage in your personal opinion. What we are here is to talk about what does the Word of God actually say. So we're dealing with this issue of leadership. Leadership. Who is fit to lead? Who is qualified to lead? And that's the question that we've been addressing in, this, in these last few sessions. And let us continue. Therefore, the plurality of leaders does not necessitate an absolute equality in every function. I think this is where we get stuck. At least, at least in my experience has been in dealing with many, many pastors in many countries as I travel extensively throughout the world and we're training pastors around the world, has been this one single issue. If I have two leaders, then that means that two of us are equal. If we have four leaders, that means four of us are equal. If we have seven leaders, that means the seven is equal. No, no, no. You know, we have not clear, then that, that, that's just an indication that you're uninformed in this specific area. Area. Let me repeat, a plurality of leaders does not necessitate an absolute equality in every function. Each pastor, each elder who leads, who helps to lead the church has a distinct function, a very distinct function, but we need each other. It's one of the things that I repeatedly say in many a different, in, especially when we get together in our social events, uh, and I say it in the church as well, we need each other. In our prayer meetings, we need each other. We need to complete each other. This is very crucial for us to understand. The church where I serve Okay, is where the church is where the Lord has me serving as a pastor. Now, I serve as the main pastor teacher, as the senior pastor. However, that this is not a one-man show. We have four other pastors who have very distinct talents, distinct gifts, and function very different ways than from when I function. But we cannot function without each other. We need each other. So in, in the case of the church where we're at, there's five of us total. Okay? And now we function in very distinct ways because we get different, distinct gifts and callings and life experience, et cetera, et cetera. But we need each other. Let me see if I can illustrate this by way of another example that has nothing to do with um, uh, the issue of leadership, but it'll, it'll, it'll highlight the issue of function. That's what I want to function. I want to focus in on the function part. So just, just, just follow me just for the moment and see if I can at least draw this out for you in, in a different and distinct way. When you have a man and a woman come together, Husband and wife. So just, just follow me for the moment. Huh? There, t there tends to be five distinct functions huh? in, in, um, in, in a marriage when we, come, when we have a couple that have come together. Now watch this. Uh, this right hand will represent the male. This left one will represent the female. Right? This is me. This is my wife. Okay? So I want you to see this in a very distinct way with regard to function. I am my wife's lover, she is my lover. I am her husband, 
she is my wife. I am the father of her children. She's the mother of my children. Do you see that? I am her best friend. She is my best friend. And she, uh, uh, okay. and it, she, I am her brother in Christ. She is my sister in Christ. So you see this here. Now watch this. When these come together, we have five functions. We complete each other. Now here's the challenge that you and I face. Okay? Is that each, these functions coexist in a parallel format, but they exist there because they have very distinct functions. Now, what happens is that many times we get out of order. Mm -hmm. But when you get out of order and you recognize each other's talents, each other's gifts, you don't have to try to be the dominant one. What you have to do is to learn to do this, is that when you fall into place, mm -hmm, we need each other. We need each other. This is crucial. So in our church, for example, we have five pastors, and we have very distinct functions, very distinct gifts and callings. I don't gather, I don't attempt to engage or get involved in the other areas that the pastors, the other pastors are, are involved with, because that's where the gifts and callings are. Now, each one is required. Each one is required in our church. You must teach and preach the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the full counsel of the word of God. However, how we function in the life of the church, in the ministry, does not, have to, does not mean that it is equal function. They're distinct function, different function. This is really crucial to putting a team together, and everybody understands their position. Everybody understands their own gifts, their own callings, and how they're to function if we're to achieve the glory and the honor of the Lord for his church. Even, and even the godliest group of leaders, some will naturally be more influential than others. That's just the reality. Some will have teaching gifts that outline, that outshine the rest. That is true. Others will be more gifted as administrators. That is true. Each can fulfill a different role, and there is no need to try to enforce absolute equality of function. Now, we have equality in position, in title, in authority, but we, did, we have distinct functions. Now, the 12, let's take the 12 for example, because what we want to do is to try to draw out from the scriptures uh, this concept as it is presented to us in the scriptures. We cannot draw something out of the scriptures that is not there. That would be an imposition of thought. What we want to do is to exegete. We want to expound and draw out what's already in the scriptures with regard to this concept of a plurality of leaders and function. Draw your Bible to, draw your, I want to draw your attention to the, back of the book of Matthew chapter 10, please. In Matthew chapter 10, and I want to look at a number of verses there with you. And let's work, let's work our way through verse 2, 3, 4 in Matthew chapter 10, verse 2. Now, the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Verse 3, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and, Th and Thaddeus. Verse 4, Simon, the zealot, Judas Iscariot, and the one who betrayed him. The one who betrayed him. Now, I just, just, just follow this for a moment with me. So we just read Matthew chapter 10, verse 2 to 4. Now jump over to Mark chapter 3, and I want you to see verses 16, 17, 18, and 19. Mark chapter 3, verses 16, 17, 18, and 19. And he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom to them he gave the name of Barnegas, which means son of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, you go, well, you're just reading the text. Yes, I want you to see it. This is the problem. You've missed it. Now, jump over to Luke. Luke. Now, Luke chapter 6. Now, I want you to see again. Now, we're doing this for a purpose. I'm not just reading scripture because I'm trying to fill in time here. Uh, look at this in Luke chapter 6. And I want you to look with me, verses 14, 15, and 16. And you're going to pick up a pattern. There's a pattern developing here. Uh, notice this, verse 14. 
Uh, Luke 6, 14, Simon, who also named Peter and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew. And then in verse 15, and Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon who was called the zealot. And then verse 16, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed, who became a traitor. Did you see what was happening there? There is an order that was laid out for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to know, now jump over to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And notice this. In Acts chapter 1, we see in verse 13, And when they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room, and they were staying. That is, Peter and John and James Notice the order at all times. We saw this in Matthew chapter 10. We saw this in, in Mark chapter 3. We see this in Luke chapter 6. Now let's jump over to Acts chapter 1 in verse 13. And it says, And when they entered the city, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter, John, and James, and Andrew, and Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. Are you noticing that there's a pattern here? There's a priori. There is a, pro, a, pro, a pattern here okay, of, of the names of the apostles. And notice the order. They seem to, be, to, be, they seem to divide naturally into four groups. I want you to know. Now, we just read it. Go back. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts. There seems to be this natural divine order okay, that is divided naturally into four groups. Now, the first four names listed are always Peter, James, John, and Andrew. I don't care. Whatever list that you're reading from, depending on what version of the Bible you're reading from, you're always going to see those four first. So this will be the first group, the first group. And then and, and Peter's name always heads the list, and the other three are listed in varying order. But basically, this will be the first group. Remember, there are 12 apostles or 12, at this point, there's 12 disciples. Um, and then Peter's, so Peter's name is always at the top. He's, list, he's, he's leading this group. This would be the main guy here. However, he's listed within a group of people. Now, those four dominate the gospel narratives. They pretty much dominate the gospel, the gospel narratives. And three of them are often seen with Christ apart from the other nine. So you, you, you we're talking about specifically um, James, John, and Andrew. Uh, we see them always with Christ, apart with Christ, than from the other nine that you're going to that you speak of. Let me give you an example. Go to Matthew 17:1. Um, <clears throat> we're going through a lot of scripture, and you're going, well, "Why do I have to do this?" Why have to? Well, because I'm asking you to. But besides that, I really want to focus in. I want to show you something that. We have this false narrative. This, we have this false uh, issue that comes up. We cannot have an equal number or, of people uh, in the same title, same type of, of position. That's not true. The issue is function. It's function. There is no competition here. Notice how this falls out. Now, I said to you that three of them, are often seen with Christ apart from the other nine. Now, in Matthew 7, chapter 17, verse 1, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. You see the three? Now, look at um, Mark chapter 5, verse 37. We see here, uh, and he allowed, in Mark 5, 37, and he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. So we see Peter, James, and John. We constantly see these three as always apart with Christ. Mark 13, 3. In Mark 13, 3, we see, and he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew were questioning him privately. This is separate now from the other eight. And then in Mark 14, 33, Mark 14, 33, it says, and he took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be very distressed and troubled. So Jesus walked, and there are 12 disciples. But the ones that, if you're going to, 
for lack of a better term, if you're going to look at the leaderboard, right? You know how they play in golf, right? And they have this leaderboard laid in it out, okay? And they have this leaderboard where they lay down, you know, the, the, top, the top golfers. Well, here we have a leaderboard that's laid out for us very specifically here. It, 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 we should not be surprised at all. Now, there's a second group. Now, notice the second group here as we turn our scriptures to the book of Acts. The second group includes Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew. Philip's name always heads the second group. But the other three are ordered differently in different places. So in the first group, it's always Peter. In the second group, it's always Philip who leads that group. And so we see this, uh, we see this often. Now the third group consists of James, Thaddeus, Olabius, also known as Judas, son of James. He had different uh, names here. And Simon and Judas Iscariot. James' name always heads that list. So we have the third group. So we have basically, we have three groups of people, right? Peter is leading one. Philip is leading another one. And James leads another one. Now they're all equal as, uh, as disciples. They're all equals as, as apostles. But notice the function. Each, now each group or each subgroup has a leader. So each group seems to have its unofficial leader. Peter was usually the leader uh, and spokesman for all 12. Their office and their privileges were equal, but their influence and importance varied according to the gifts and personalities. Please allow me to repeat this because this is a problem. This is not just some small, minute problem. This is a huge problem in the church, in many, many churches. Because we've not understood this concept of plurality of leaders. Again, so each group seems to have its, have its unofficial leader. That's going to always happen. Peter was usually the leader, the spokesman of all 12. Their office and their privilege were equal, but their influence... And importance varied according to the gifts and personalities. Nothing suggests that Peter had a higher office than the others. We do not find that in the scriptures. He certainly is never portrayed as the Pope in the Bible. I don't care what the Roman Catholics say. He was never portrayed as the Pope in the Bible. In Acts chapter 15, in verse 13, for example, it was James, the Lord's brother, according to Galatians, uh, Chapter 1, verse 19, not one of the 12 who announced the Jerusalem Council's decision, even though Peter was present and testified. So there was always this respect for function. Notice in Acts chapter 15, verse 13, and after they had stopped speaking, James answered saying, brethren, listen to me. Now, James is the head of the church in Jerusalem. And they all acquiesced and they gave him the room that he needed as the main spokesperson. Now in Galatians, in chapter 1, verse 19, but I did not see any other of the, other, of the, other, of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So this is Paul making this statement because James, the Lord's brother, was the one who was in charge of the church. So leaders right, who are biblical will always acquiesce will always acquiesce, will always submit and step back. Now, I, as the, um, as the main pastor teacher or senior pastor of our church, I understand what takes place. The other pastors will step back, not because they're less, because they are not. Because in that specific role, they'll step back and submit. Now, for example, if I was to talk about Pastor Phil Bernal, for example, he has so many different experiences and so much more talent and so much more of this and so much more of that than I. Yeah? And then I have to submit to him and I do so willingly, okay, uh, because he, has, he knows so much other things that I do not know and I don't want to know. I will do the same thing for the other pastors uh, as we function. For example, one of our pastors is headed to Peru in South America and when I am there, I always play second banana to him. Why? Because I put him in front because he's the one that everybody recognizes as the authority. We have our first service, uh, which is in the Spanish language, in our first service, and we have two of our other pastors there, and I step back, 
and allow them to function a, a service that I ran for many, 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 many years, but now I no longer do because I decided I had to step back and allow the other, the other leaders to step up and, and fulfill the role. And so then publicly, I will also step back to allow them and give them the authority that they need, but it's also the respect that they deserve. And in Antioch, the Apostle Paul withstood Peter. In other words, he confronted Peter for this very issue. And it says in the book of Galatians, in chapter 2, verse 11, But when Cephas, or Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. In other words, a leader has to have the responsibility and the courage and the integrity Right? And, and the spiritual wherewithal to go and confront another leader when something is not correct. Peter clearly wielded no more authority and held no higher office than any of the other 12, although he plainly was the strongest leader in the group. As noted, Peter and John together dominate the early chapters of the book of Acts. But Peter was always the spokesperson and the preacher. And John, of course, had equal authority. And partly because he lived longer, he wrote more of the New Testament than Peter did, including the gospel that bears his name and three epistles and as well as the book of Revelation. But when John and Peter were together, Peter always did the speaking. Likewise, although Barnabas obviously had remarkable teaching gifts, Paul was always the dominant member of that duo. Are you getting the picture that we, we don't need a conflict? What we need is a clarification. And in fact, many times you don't even have to speak it. You don't even have to state it. It's understood because biblical leaders understand biblical principles. Now, when we don't have biblical leaders with a biblical understanding, but we do have, we do have God called leaders but they lack understanding, then you must clarify the issues because if you don't clarify the issues, this is going to create a war. It's going to create an issue of the flesh where the flesh is going to rise when it, doesn't, it does not need to rise at all. We must be more biblical than political. We must be more biblical than cultural. Do you understand what I'm saying? We must be more biblical than secular. There is no competition even among 12 very strong men who went to conquer the world for the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ, as well as the Apostle Paul. Everybody understood their role because they were biblical in nature and there was no hard feelings and no one felt as though they were inferior to somebody else who thought that he was superior.